One of gaming's most exciting times for me was when the Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16 hit the North American market in 1989. It was the start of the fourth generation of console gaming, and we had new promises of software that would be much closer to the arcade than ever before. While I was instantly captivated by Sega's Genesis, I was also impressed with what I was seeing from NEC and Hudson Soft. It had been out in Japan for quite a while as the PC Engine, so I had already seen some of its games get coverage in various magazines of the time. Many had called it glorified 8-bit technology, but I didn't give a rat's ass what you labeled it. Its games looked great to me, and that's all that mattered. When I finally secured a Turbo Graphics of my own in 1990, I was blown away by its quality. Whether it was original titles like the action platformer Legendary Axe, or the killer arcade ports like R-Type, I was scrounging and saving money like crazy, trying my best to rent games for both new consoles, while buying the odd game here and there when I could. Among one of my earliest Turbo Graphics purchases was a port of Namco's 1988 arcade classic, Splatterhouse, a title that was already scoring big with critics. The home version was developed in-house by Namco, and released on the Turbo in 1990. I was a big fan of scary movies, so I just knew this was going to be a winner. Just in time for Halloween, we're going to take a look at this one and see if it's worth your time. I hope you guys enjoy my review of Splatterhouse for the TurboGrafx-16. Splatterhouse's gameplay was much like many of the games you saw in the arcade back then. Stages consisted mainly of left to right scrolling play areas that were filled with enemies and obstacles that you had to overcome to move forward. At the end of every level there was of course a boss fight you had to deal with as well. If I left a description of its gameplay right there you could come away thinking there was little special about it, and it could easily be dismissed. But console video games at this point really hadn't tried to be scary or gory. Even when a famous slasher flick was converted to game form, it often was a silly representation of the original media. Splatterhouse had been different though. While the core gameplay mechanics were indeed tried and true, it was the execution that made all the difference. Enemies just didn't flash and disappear when killed. Instead, each one had its own death animation, everything from splatting against walls to their guts rolling out on the floor. You even got weapons to aid you during your killing spree. 2x4s, shotguns, and meat cleavers were available in addition to your normal punches and kicks. It touched upon many aspects of popular horror films of the time as well. The main protagonist looked like Jason Voorhees of Friday the 13th fame, and it hit on topics like curses, possession, and ghost. Even the story went well beyond what you normally saw in gaming. Rick and his girlfriend Jennifer seek refuge during a violent storm. Unfortunately, that happens to be in the West Mansion, site of brutal experiments by a deranged doctor. Jennifer is immediately taken by monsters, Rick is killed, and things couldn't possibly get any worse. Until, of course, an ancient artifact attaches itself to your dead-ass body and brings you back to life, offering you a chance to save the woman you love. It was a simple but glorious setup that many third-generation titles never offered. Also, unlike many games of the time, were alternate routes during gameplay. Not every stage had them, but at certain points you could change up the direction of your adventure. While each path still ended up in the same area at the end of the stage, it was nice to see the typically straightforward arcade action game mix it up a bit. Since this landed not too long after the start of the fourth generation, you can imagine how impressive these visuals were at the time. They just didn't replicate the original arcade well, but also stood strong next to the rest of the software on the TurboGrafx-16, and indeed against the best on the Sega Genesis. Sprites were large and well animated, backgrounds were detailed and colorful. Years later, finding out this was a mere 4 megabit hue card blew my mind. I mean, the variety alone for such a small footprint was impressive, but once you considered its competition that was the same size that year, you really have to hand it to the developers. 
I mean, it was one of those games that made you curious about the platform well before you ever had a chance to play it. Despite this strong showing, you will notice some differences between the US home version, the Japanese home version, and the arcade if you ever play them all. Some of these changes were a result of the small 4 megabit storage, while others were design changes related to censorship. Namco was worried about possible litigation against the game because the main character resembled Jason Voorhees so much, so the US version has a red mask instead of the white one in the arcade and Japanese PC Engine edition. Religious imagery is also censored in the US release. Stage 4 has been altered to look less like a church, and the boss has been redesigned as a floating head instead of an upside down cross. Other visual changes include a simplified opening and ending cinema, and certain animations being cut back from the arcade. These changes are unfortunate, but do nothing to hurt the overall presentation. It still looks and runs great, and provided early adopters of the TurboGrafx-16 something to be proud of. I was always impressed with the music of Splatterhouse as well. The better gaming soundtracks back then had a way of being just as important as the visuals themselves, often helping set the mood of what you were seeing on the screen. I had never really heard anything like it before. It was eerie, creepy, and sometimes just as disturbing as the blood and guts. I always enjoyed the unique music the Turbo could produce, and for the most part it's a winner. Sadly, another side effect of the small chip size was a big hit in the variety of the sound effects. The arcade had many more samples for things going splat and being violently murdered. You won't miss it if you've never played the arcade, but back to back there is a noticeable downgrade. Let's have a listen to a few choice cuts. Most of the critiques you'll see leveled at Splatterhouse bash it for its simplicity. Not enough moves, and it's short. But when you place it against the other arcade-style games in 1990, it definitely holds up. I mean, it gave you different weapons to dispatch enemies, different routes to take, and some pretty epic boss encounters. For the era, it easily competed well against other games not just for the platform, but elsewhere as well. In fact, if you are finding it too short and easy, I highly advise you try the hard mode. It effectively doubles the damage each enemy can take and makes for a much more difficult experience. For what it's worth, these critiques aren't completely without merit, however. The aforementioned censorship in the US release definitely makes the Japanese PC Engine version more desirable. I also feel that Namco could have added a few stages to it to really give the home version something special over the arcade original. While some stages do have sub-areas, others are one-shots to the boss and the battle is over. Most will be able to beat this in about 30 minutes the very first time, while a seasoned vet can take it in as little as 10. But these small complaints do nothing to take away from the overall excellent presentation and fun gameplay that is present here. Indeed, it was the early days of what many of us called the 16-bit era, but it no less provided great action and thrills in line with the better arcade ports of the time. The real strength of this game lies mostly in its easy to pick up gameplay, presentation, and mature themes. It doesn't treat you like a child, particularly deeper in the game when it becomes clear that Rick and Jennifer won't be having a happy ending. Making your way across the West Mansion reveals all sorts of disturbing enemies and areas, 
from filthy waterways with slime creatures to a chainsaw-wielding madman in the garden. Whereas some claim the gameplay too simple, I'd argue it's just good enough to not get in your way. You are given what you need to fend for yourself, leaving the setting, the creatures, and the freaky atmosphere to do all the heavy lifting. That was okay by me because these things are so well done, they stand up well to the scrutiny. One could argue that later games in the series complicated the formula a bit too much, taking away from the simple charms and appeal seen here. There are a few ways to play this one today, including the recently released TurboGrafx Mini and the arcade version in Namco Museum for the Nintendo Switch. It's a great one to revisit during the Halloween season if you haven't played it in a while, and a must play if you have never had the pleasure. I'm Sega Lord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time. In 1989, Namco released one of my favorite arcade titles in North America, Splatterhouse. Combining a number of pop culture horror references, it was a gruesome action game where you must rescue your girlfriend from certain doom. The setting was awesome, a spooky mansion full of evil creatures that needed to be gutted in order for you to see the ending. When it came home to the TurboGrafx-16 a year later, it was a big reason why I wanted that console. That port was incredible, capturing much of the appeal of the arcade, right down to enemies exploding into piles of goo. A few years would go by without a sequel to this great game, but in 1992, Namco finally published one. Not in the arcade or on the Turbo, but instead on the Sega Genesis of all places. Namco didn't develop this one in-house, instead it was done by Now Production, a Japanese developer who had done the god-awful Quad Challenge the previous year. Different platform and a different developer, could it possibly live up to the fun and excitement of the original? Let's find out. The end of the first Splatterhouse was a shocker, the kind of ending you remember because video games were always happy affairs once the credits rolled. The story of Splatterhouse 2 directly continues those events. Rick, the protagonist from the original game is haunted by visions of the mask, telling him that his girlfriend Jennifer doesn't have to be dead and he can go back and save her. Rick, torn apart by his guilt, decides he's gonna do it and so Splatterhouse 2 begins. The gameplay here has seen little in the way of change or refinement. Rick still has pretty much the gameplay he had in the first. You have just two buttons to worry about in this one. One attacks and one jumps. When Rick is standing, the attack is a simple punch. When ducking, it's a kick. He can also jump kick and has a slide attack if you hold a diagonal down position after you jump. But the real meat of Splatterhouse 2's gameplay are the weapons you have access to during the adventure. Rick can use pipes, bones, chainsaws, shotguns, and even beakers of potassium bombs to help him get Jennifer back. Unfortunately, the stronger of these items have very limited ammunition and you'll need to use them sparingly and at the right times to get the most out of them. Enemies range from the easily dispatched zombie to massive horrors that can fill half the screen. With the mansion from the first game destroyed, you must fight your way past it to the new house. You don't actually find where Jennifer's soul is trapped until stage 5, which means the majority of this adventure takes place on outside stages. While most of it is on foot, you do occasionally get an elevator or boat ride to change up the setting a tad. The challenge is manageable, especially with a password system that gets you back to the last stage you played. The original TurboGrafx-16 version did a fine job recreating the arcade and while the Genesis effort here doesn't have a comparable release to pull inspiration from, it's still a solid representation from what you'd expect in a sequel. The locations are suitably creepy, the main character sprite looks the part, and since the original game was kinda dark and dreary, the Genesis color palette doesn't strangle the visual assets otherwise. To its credit, we do see some of the trademark staples of the Genesis hardware at work. There are a few stages with some very nice parallax effects, 
Some of the bosses are huge, and the animation is suitably gruesome thanks to the 8 megabit cartridge. I think it holds up well visually next to the original, and overall is about what I was expecting. There are a few crappy visual aspects you must deal with that has some nasty fake transparencies that look just terrible on a modern display. But you guys know the deal here. A quality CRT with composite and you'd have a very different outlook. My only real complaint in this department is that perhaps the developers played it a bit too safe on some of the stages. Some repeat assets entirely too often and the flatness of the backdrops you play against just doesn't scream out that it's a Genesis game. Some line scrolling effects really could have made these areas pop. Still, for 1992, I think the graphics are overall nice and hold up quite well. The sound in Splatterhouse 2 is a real mixed bag. There are some tracks here that really stand out and fit the mood and setting beautifully. No joke, they are just as strong as the Turbo original. But this also has some of the most ear-piercing sound effects you've ever heard, marring an otherwise winning presentation. The voice samples suck too. Let's get a few examples going so you can see what I mean. The original Splatterhouse is one of my favorite games on the TurboGrafx-16, and as much as I enjoyed this one, I cannot say the same for it. The formula was respected here and the end product does what it needs to, to be a solid sequel. But was it enough? I think the developers may have stuck too close to the original script. There aren't any great strides made in any one area to really make it stand out. It pretty much looks and plays like the arcade did four years earlier. This will have a profound effect on some of you, as the shock appeal of its blood and guts just doesn't have the same impact now. The mixed bag sound and music is another spot of contention. While some of what's here is excellent, the stuff that is less than ideal really sticks out. So much so that there are stretches of gameplay where I genuinely turn the volume down to avoid it. But there is something to be said about celebrating simplicity. While I was a younger man, I was always searching for new and unique experiences in gaming. But now that I'm older and my time limited, I'm finding that the tried and true experiences tend to hold up quite well. While lacking anything truly revolutionary, Splatterhouse 2 proudly sticks to its arcade roots and has no shame continuing that journey. Your experience with it will likely hinge on how much you enjoyed the original and how you expected a sequel to play out. If you wanted more of the same, this should satiate those expectations. But if you wanted an evolution of gameplay that saw a ton of changes, this one will likely disappoint. Like many games of the time, Splatterhouse 2 saw numerous changes when it was localized for Western markets. It starts with the artwork for the case. Whoa, what a difference. I much prefer the look of the Japanese edition by a mile. From there, changes fall into little things like the title screens being different 
and the mask on Rick having a different design aesthetic, to some pretty major changes like the Japanese version not having a password system and limited continues. Finally, the number of lives and the amount of health you start with is notably different between the two. In Japan, you start with less lives but more hearts, while the opposite was true of the Western variant. For those interested, the Japanese version is completely in English, making it an easy one to import. Splatterhouse 2 is not cheap to collect in 2021. A complete inbox set usually goes north of $200, making this an emulation first demo if you've never played it before. It must have sold well because Namco got now production to do a sequel to it in 1993, a 16 megabit beat em up that changed the core gameplay design quite a bit. But the burning question is do I recommend you play Splatterhouse 2 today? Absolutely. I think as far as sequels go, it did a good job capturing the arcade original spirit and its simplicity is actually a bonus for what it was. This one is easy to pick up for 15 minutes here and there, and once you get good, you can beat the entire thing in 30 minutes. But don't feel bad if you didn't like it as much as I did. Splatterhouse 2 was a contentious game, even at its release. Publications like GamePro loved it, showering it with praise across the board but it also received some crushing critiques from the likes of Sega Pro, who absolutely shat on it with almost nothing good to say. In my time as Sega Lord X, I've seen similar variants in opinions among my subscribers. Some love it for sticking so close to formula, while others found it a bore fest. Even so, if you have yet to play it, I highly recommend you at least give it a go once to see if it's your type of thing. I love these types of games for their accessibility and pick up and play qualities. You just don't need to spend a lot of time with it to get some enjoyment out of it. Arcade games may be simple, but at least you won't spend 30 minutes of your life looking at cinematics, credits, or tutorials you can't skip just to play the damn thing. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time. Namco's Splatterhouse series started as an arcade release in 1988. It featured gruesome side-scrolling action that was filled with a level of violence and gross-out imagery you typically didn't see at the time. When a home version showed up, it was the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 that got the call, and it was a remarkable conversion. Most of the stage layouts were faithful, and it even kept much of its visual punch. It quickly became one of my favorites, and I replayed it countless times to see everything it had to offer. A few years would go by before we saw any more games in the series, but that finally happened in 1992 and on the Sega Genesis of all places. Splatterhouse 2 was more of what made the original so good, with developer Now Production doubling down on the arcade style action. But while I enjoyed it, it received quite the mixed reaction. Some gaming magazines loved it, while others were extremely tough on it. It sold well, however, and in 1993, a sequel showed up once again, courtesy of Now Production. But this one did not follow the arcadey design of the first and second. In fact, it was a wholly new experience that changed the formula completely. In this episode, just in time for Halloween, we will take a look at Splatterhouse 3, talk a bit about how it changed things, and see if it's worth playing today. Hope you guys enjoy my review of Splatterhouse 3 for your Sega Genesis. The story in Splatterhouse 3 takes a curious turn for the better, at least at first. Both Jennifer and Rick survive the events of Part 2 and get back to a normal life. They do well, hitting it big in stocks, and eventually have a son named David. Life is good and they decide to move to a small town in Connecticut and settle down. But their new fairy tale life comes to a crashing halt as the Evil One returns, looking for the Dark Stone. 
It seems your son's psychic abilities are key to this demon's plans, and both Jennifer and David are taken. Once again, the Terror Mask calls to you so you can have the power to rescue them both. Yep, hard to believe this crap is happening to the same guy three times now. Fortunately, Rick does have some new moves as he heads out on his adventure. Gone are the simple side-scrolling action moves of the first two, now replaced with a fully fleshed out beat-em-up engine that allows you a lot more freedom in how you attack. Normally, Rick has the ability to punch his enemies, apply a jump kick, and grab them for headbutts and multiple types of throws. Rick also has a move called the Quad Spin Kick, which hits enemies all around him. This is accomplished by using a fighting game style command of pushing the directional pad toward, away, and then towards your enemy really fast and hitting the attack button. But where things really get interesting is when you use your power gauge at the bottom left hand corner. You'll notice that as you play you will come across orbs that increase this power. Once it's charged, hit the mutate button and witness Rick hulk out into a massive brute with even more moves at your disposal. While you are powered up, your basic punch attack and jump kicks do even more damage. As before, Rick has many attack types after he grabs an enemy. You can choke, body punch, throw both forwards and backwards, and even do a wrestling style Megaton Driver. Mutated Rick also has a move that causes his guts to shoot out and hit everything around him. This is done by pressing away, towards and away and attack quickly, or basically the opposite of the regular power move. The bad news is, is that the power gauge slowly depletes as you're mutated, so use these moves wisely. As far as navigation, Splatterhouse 3 gives you a bit of choice in how you play the levels. Some rooms have multiple exits, which lead to different paths throughout the level. This is really important because you'll notice there is a timer at the top of the screen. That timer means everything because it determines the endings you'll see. Take too much time and as you can imagine, the endings get worse. As you clear out all the enemies in the room, check that map and be sure to plot the most efficient course to the boss. White doors indicate a one-way path and yellow doors act as sort of a shortcut or warp around the level. Some rooms are tougher than others so keep that in mind. You do get some help in the form of weapons sprinkled out the rooms. 2x4s, bats, cinder blocks, knives, and cleavers. There are also life replenishment in the form of hearts. Should you fail and lose all your lives, be sure to write that password down. Splatterhouse 3 is both a step forward and a step backwards visually. I love Rick's new look. Even when not powered up, he is much more fearsome looking. The monsters are suitably nasty looking as well, complete with damage animations that often have them losing body parts, blood, and guts. When they die, they melt into a pile of goo. It's on a 16 megabit cartridge, and there's no question the sprite work is very nice. The biggest issue I have with the graphics is pretty much the location. The vast majority of the game takes place inside a mansion, so you are essentially just looking at walls, bookcases, and furniture. Things do look run down and there is the occasional gore spread throughout, but there's nothing here as far as memorable set pieces, special effects, or eye-catching parallax. It's very plain, almost vanilla considering the story that takes place around it. One of the things that made the original Splatterhouse and even its sequel such a classic was the location. It was so wildly aggressive and felt just as threatening as the enemies within it. Not so with part three. The location should have been a huge part of the presentation, yet it just seems like it's there to give you backgrounds and something to look at. That leaves me quite mixed on the visuals. I like the new look of the main character and the damage the enemies take, but the backgrounds need major work. This leaves our environment sterile, without personality, and this just isn't how you want things in this type of game. I hate to say it, but when it comes to the graphical presentation of Splatterhouse 3, things could have, and should have, been a lot better.
Fortunately, the sound picks up the ball and scores a touchdown. This is a great sounding title as far as music and the majority of the sound effects. It adds so much to the atmosphere, it almost makes up for the ho-hum backdrops. A lot of it sounds like it's paying respect to the original game, and that's just fine by me. Let's have a listen to some of the selections to see if you feel the same way. Looking at Splatterhouse 3 on a whole, there's a lot here to like. The gameplay is fun, and there are many moves to learn and use to beat down your foes. The combat is responsive, and it's done well enough that it keeps you engaged the entire time. Enemies range from easy fodder, you just walk up to and smash, to monsters you need to approach in a variety of different ways to mitigate their attacks. There's some real strategy in that. The time limit and the endings it influences really make for a compelling ride as well. It creates a tension that is always clawing at your nerves, and that contributes heavily to a successful horror product. No joke, getting the better endings requires many failed exploration attempts to see which is the best route to take. The cinematics that tell the story at the beginning, middle, and end are also suitably creepy. It's black and white, but the imagery feels like something you would have seen in the 60s or 70s, which also adds to the retro vibe perfectly. Subject matter, like a giant worm feasting on your wife's internal organs and brain, is the stuff of nightmares. I also want to really praise the music again. I really enjoyed it, and I feel it added so much to the overall journey. But I'd be lying if I told you this game is awesome all the way around. As I mentioned, I feel the visuals lack a certain punch. The two previous games landed with impact. This is mainly due to the backgrounds not featuring any real special effects or standout artistic designs. I've seen better in 8-bit releases, and they do a disservice to the setting, the story, and the characters. That of course brings about the question, do the backgrounds ruin the entire experience? Is the not scary at all location that much of a hindrance? Absolutely not. Fortunately, where the scenery fails, the sprite work, the gameplay, cinematics, and music make it all the better. They elevate the feelings of uneasiness and the macabre to a level that sustains the entire adventure. I can only imagine how much better this could have been with a little more work on the visuals, but I will take Splatterhouse 3 as it is, because it's a great ride while it lasts. If you want some advice while playing Splatterhouse 3, take your time and don't be afraid to fail the first dozen or so play sessions. That time limit can be tough to combat, and you'll need some practice with the various rooms and shortcuts until you understand the best way through. Not everything is as obvious as it may seem. Once you get your bearings and become familiar with the maps, this becomes a great beat-em-up with a creepy story and excellent music and many of the publications at the time felt so as well. Electronic Gaming Monthly said it was fun and rated it strong, and GamePro absolutely raved about it, 
giving it a nearly perfect score. Surprisingly, it was the UK magazines that were somewhat down on the game. They usually harped on originality and replay value, but otherwise admit it, it was a good time. And I think most of you will agree with that. No matter how you feel in the end, I think you will at least have had a bit of fun with this one. It wasn't just a rehash of the previous games, and I think that was the right move by the developers at Now Production. What is curious is that a few places on the internet have claimed that the MA13 rating came as a result of things being toned down to avoid a higher mature content label. Could this be the reason the background graphics lack the same level of violence and gore seen in the previous games? It's a good question, and I wonder what this could have been had the developers been given their freedom to design what they had wanted. Luckily, we are still left with a very solid game, and one that should entertain you quite well during a dark and stormy evening. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.